Okay, so six o'clock on Wednesday. I missed this past time, because it was <laughs> this last week, but uh, everybody says it was a really good time. And so, uh, yeah, remember that on, on Wednesday. I also have this in my hand here. This is uh, called Gloria. It's a the Lapeer the concert, Lapeer concert choir that's singing this afternoon in Trinity Church in Lapeer, Trinity Methodist at 4 o'clock. This is what uh, Doris Verstick is involved with this. Uh, I saw it uh, on Friday along with Jim, sat <laughs> right behind Jim. Wonderful singing uh, Christmas things and, and um, <coughs> other songs, but a really a wonderful brass ensemble. I mean, just um, very professional. <laughs> um, a lot of the people that play in the, in the Bell Valley band were there with trumpets and trombones, and it was really, uh, really inspiring. <laughs> um, and so if you get into the Christmas spirit, that's this afternoon at 4 o'clock at Trinity Methodist in the pier. Anything else? Good morning, folks. Just to thank you again for uh, Rod for getting the chimes out. There's a new addition. Uh, thanks for all your work on that. There is also if you'll note in the chimes, a new prayer list. If you have any updates to that prayer list that's in there for people we should hold in prayer or be concerned about, please get them to me, email them, call me, text me. We update them as we get updates. So thank you for all of that. Of course, we have our Christmas ornament and our cookbook in Fellowship Hall, great stocking stuffers. If you're looking for something, uh, Thelma told you about um, a potluck coming up. Can't stress enough, you are warmly welcome to bring in people uh, to next Sunday's potluck, bring a dish to pass, and of course the wonderful raffle in which the proceeds will go to our food pantry. Again, thank you everybody for your participation in our reverse advent calendar. Um, it's been wonderful, great to see all of that and, and all the donations uh, coming in. And lastly, a, a big welcome to everybody uh, watching and listening on Facebook. We have communion this morning, so we invite you to have your favorite morning beverage and a um, piece of bread so you can virtually take part in communion with us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This morning we start our service with the lighting of our Advent candle, and today we think of peace. People of God, many heroic men and women have taken great risk to bring peace in the world. It can be dangerous to call for peace. Today, we light a candle to symbolize God's peace. We hope in the one who will come. We pray for God's peace to prevail. People of God, take courage. Rise as we are able and sing one of the Christmas favorites, O oh, Little Town of Bethlehem. It's in your hand, uh, your handout. Deep and dreamy. 
Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. Oh, morning stars together proclaim the holy birth and praises sing to God the King and peace to men on earth. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, O oh, Lord, Emmanuel. Good news. The Holy One claims us as God's very own. Rejoice in the Lord. Good news. God is in our midst, ready to renew us with holy love. Rejoice in the Lord always. We rejoice. Good news. Good news. The peace of the Lord will dwell in our hearts. We lift them up our hearts in thanksgiving. Thanks be to God. Joyful God, move us. Make our hands, take our hands, and lead us in your dance of creation. When our steps falter, surround us with the strength of your spirit. Guide us, God, until we are moved and sing with the joy of your salvation. In the name of Emmanuel, God with us, we pray. Amen. So sing with us. To the Spirit, to Jesus Christ, to the eternal source. From the time of our beginnings, beyond death's claim upon us, life, light, and love shall never end. Amen. A prayer of confession. We give thanks, O oh God, that you are unchanging, that your concern for justice, justice and righteousness was so strong that you came in human form to share that concern with us. Forgive us, O oh God, for the times when we have been happy to hear the gospel without truly living it. 
Forgive us for uncaring attitudes when we base our opinion on other people's worth on what they own or how they look or on what they say or how they live rather than accepting them for who they are, people made in your image. Forgive us and our wrong need to live simply and with humility, if defeated by selfish desires for pursuing profit before seeking your will. Forgive us for sometimes not focusing on the Christ child born in a poor stable. Our hope lies in the promise of your mercy, O God, extending to those who fear you from generation to generation. Heal, restore, and bless us for the sake of Christ our Savior. Amen. May the God of peace cleanse you. The promise is that your, our whole being, spirit, soul, and body, will be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rejoice then and give thanks as we receive forgiveness and healing in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading comes this morning from that wonderful story of Esther. And the scripture begins quite a ways through the story. So it may, may not make not a lot of sense to you right now, but the pastor is going to give the whole story. And so you'll know uh, all the background by the time you're done. But the, the reading begins rather in the middle. But you will know the rest of the story by the time we're done. <laughs> okay. When Mordecai learned of all the things that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and the order of the king came, there was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuch and the female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hatak, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend to her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hatak went to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money that Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave them a copy of the text of the edict of their annihilation, which had been published in Susa to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him uh, to instruct her to go to the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hatak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that if any man or woman who approaches a king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, and that is to put to death unless the king extends to them the royal scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days has passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you are alone of all the Jews that will escape. For if you remain silent, 
at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's families will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, nights or days. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. This is God's word. In 1884, American Civil War General, of course from the South, General William Tecumseh Sherman, made a remark that many politicians, I can tell you, have borrowed over and over and over again down through the years. Sherman said, I will not accept if nominated and will not serve if elected. He said those words after someone had asked him if he was going to be considered as the Republican candidate for president. Many years later, in 1968, President Lyndon B. Johnson, a Democrat, essentially said those exact same words in a televised address to the nation. LBJ said, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. I'm sure LBJ was tired by the war in Vietnam, just like William Tecumseh Sherman was very tired from the Civil War. They had their reasons for saying no. These politicians that said these words, these generals, all had the skills and knowledge necessary to serve their country. They knew their friends, they knew their adversaries and how to govern, and certainly knew the world of politics very, very well. For one moment in time, they were presented with an opportunity to consider and make a decision on how to act on it. Esther also had her moment in time that we find today. Or to put another way, as written in verse 14 of our scripture passage, she faced for such a time as this. A lot has happened before and after the story that's in our scripture passage. Let's recap what happened before we, where we find ourselves today and after. The king of the Persian Empire, parts of which lie today in present area that we know as Iran, throws a huge party that lasts for days and days and days. He banishes from the king's court his wife, Queen, Vanist, excuse me, Queen Vashti, after she refused the king's request to come before him. After a while, the king begins to miss his queen. Some in the king's court propose, king, let's have a beauty contest from which the king can select a new queen. From all over Persia's 127 provinces, beautiful women are brought to the palace. One of the women who appears at the beauty contest is Esther a Jew living in Persia's capital city. Esther is an orphan. She was raised by Mordecai. Mordecai, who scholars say was either a cousin or an uncle to Esther. Mordecai, by the way, is one of the leaders of the Jewish people who endured the Babylonian exile. Mordecai wisely instructs Esther not to reveal who her family is or that she is a Jew. A year later, the beauty contest ends, and Esther wins it. The royal crown is placed on her head. Esther is now the new queen of Persia in place of 
Queen Vashti. Interestingly enough, Mordecai doesn't tell anyone that he is related to the new queen, but he does frequent the palace gates one day. Here's the, new, here's the news about Esther, how she's doing as queen. And on one other day in particular, she overhears two men plotting to murder the king, and he quickly sends word to Esther, who in turn reveals the plot to the king in the name of Mordecai. The plotters are caught and killed. Mordecai's names, name rather, and deeds are celebrated by the king. He is now in a very prominent position in the king's court because of what happened. In the meantime, the king appoints a man, as Steve mentioned, as Hamak. Haman, excuse me, the king appoints a man named Haman to be the prime minister. In one of his first acts as prime minister, Haman issues a decree that all should bow down to him. Mordecai refuses to bow down before Haman, which, not surprisingly, infuriates Haman. Haman and his family, we find out, have never liked the Jewish people. So he goes before the king with 10,000 silver pieces and asks for permission to destroy the Jews commit genocide, wipe them out from the face of the earth in Persia. He presents this issue to the king as a matter of loyalty, saying, there are certain people scattered and spread out among the peoples in all the states of your kingdom. Their laws are different from other peoples, and they do not observe the king's laws. So it is not worth for the king to leave them alive. The king agrees and issues an edict to all 127 provinces in Persia, saying that on the 13th day of the 12th month, the Jews are to be exterminated and all their property kept as plunder. Well, as you can imagine, the, this edict caused great alarm among the Jewish people in Persia. The Jews, including Mordecai, as we heard, donned sock, sackcloths and ashes, both symbols of distress and grief, and they all wonder, when will they be killed? Mordecai springs into action. He sends word to Esther that she must go before the king and stop this awful, awful situation from becoming a reality. It's at this moment in time that Esther begins to fully understand what she can do in her newfound role as queen, both in the spotlight and behind the scenes. And it's at this moment, for such a time as this, that she feels, to use some lingo from today's time, the full weight of the office of queen and the responsibilities that go with it and the full weight of the Jewish people's angst, worry, and despair on her shoulders. The fate of the Jews living in Persia Facing genocide, their fate is now in her hands. That's uh, quite a moment. We know all about genocide committed against the Jews, don't we? Estimates I've seen claim that as many as six million Jews died during World War II and in the Holocaust, an awful, terrible event in our global history. Interestingly enough, this year marks the 25th anniversary of Schindler's List. You may remember that powerful movie. If you recall, it highlights how German industrialist Oskar Schindler put forward an effort that saved the lives of more than 1,100 Jews during the Holocaust. This movie is being re-released at a time in which some generations, it seems, behind us have never heard about the Holocaust. Some even deny it ever happened. And worldwide, there are reports, a stark rise of world reports, about more violence targeting Jewish communities and a rise in anti-Semitism. The Anti-Defamation League, which tracks anti-Semitic behavior nationwide in the United States, found that there were more than 2,700 incidents in 2021 
of anti-Semitism, a rise of 34% compared to 2020. Of course, we remember it was only back in October at the Pittsburgh Tree of Life Synagogue in which 11 worshipers were killed, targeted. Calling out anti-Semitism and rejecting it wherever it is present and taking steps to stop it and to prevent violence from happening as a result of it is our job. We may not be of the Jewish heritage, my friends, but we as Christians, remember, are related to the Jewish faithful than Israel. Recall Paul in Romans 9 and 11 talking about this. In chapter 11, for example, he speaks about an olive tree to the Gentiles, whom, if you remember, are us, anybody that are not Jews. Paul said, if some of an olive tree's branches were broken off, you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted into their place to share the rich root of the olive tree. There you have it. There is our tie, our root to the people of Israel. Anti-Semitism, or for that matter, any kind of hate speech, my friends, that singles out people for their race, creed, color, or sexual orientation must always be confronted. No questions asked. Again, we have another tragic situation that took place because of this. I think of the five people who were killed and the many who were injured in a shooting at a gay nightclub in Colorado Springs recently. Very sad. Certainly, Esther had to be familiar with hate speech and violence being committed against her people in Persia. Now she finds herself at the precipice of being able to help them, save them. Now, understandably, Esther is worried about her safety in doing what Mordecai asks. Go, unannounced, to see the king in order to save her Jewish brothers and sisters in Persia. Get the king to reverse his edict calling for the death of the Jews. You see, seeing the king without being invited risked death under an apparent Persian law or custom. Simply because you didn't ask, you could be killed for seeing the king. Undoubtedly, it may have been also a security precaution by the king's court. Mordecai's ask to Esther was a big one. It could mean her death. But she didn't mince words, if you notice that today in Scripture. For such a time as this, Esther needed to step up, put aside her fear of death, and act to save her people. Mordecai's ask was blunt, and it was honest. He basically comes out and says, if you do die as a result of attempting to ask the king to reverse his edict, so be it. Death is death. Prepare for it, Esther. It could happen. Just go do it. Decision time for Esther. She doesn't blink. She could have played it safe and enjoyed peace by not doing anything at all and enjoy her opening times as being the queen. But she chose to act, go forward, and assume a huge, huge leadership role. She steps up, she takes charge, and commands Mordecai to tell her Jewish faithful, don't fear, I am going to intercede on your behalf. And she calms down the Jewish people by telling them, go ahead, fast, don your sockcloths and ashes, and wait for the outcome of my request to the king. As we know, her request was successful. The king ultimately rescinds his ordinance of death against the Jewish people. Esther was part of a marginalized minority who took action on behalf of her fellow Jews in Persia. I don't know about you, but sometimes it seems as though in most cases it's the marginalized who always have to stand up and advocate for themselves because oftentimes others might think, well, it's not happening to me, so why should I care? It's happening on the other side of the globe, down the street, in another state. Somebody else will take care of it. Esther didn't have that luxury. Esther shows us that we are called to act rather than leave it up to someone else to act. Esther took a huge risk, 
of standing up to the death dealing power of genocide looming for her people rather than choosing the paper over a situation and pretend that hey everything's going to be okay she didn't say i don't want to make a scene i need to stay quiet i don't want to go against the status quo i want to be queen she doesn't go there thank god peace peace as esther showed us doesn't come from not rocking the boat or not wanting to stray from groupthink and the herd. Peace doesn't come from pretense. Peace comes from courage. Here is what is really interesting when it comes to the book of Esther and her situation. Did you notice that God is not mentioned anywhere in Esther? No. God is not mentioned anywhere in Esther and neither is a prophet of God. Esther acts on her behalf, on her own accord, but on behalf of God and God's chosen people in Persia. In this particular case, Esther knew deep down that she had to act. And what's also interesting is that she found what we might call today as all the stars lining up for her to act. Esther suddenly found herself in the right place at the right time to act. God didn't say, Esther, go help my people. But God certainly set things in motion by placing her, positioning, pre-positioning her, I might add, to help a young Jewish woman suddenly becomes the queen to help out her people just in the nick of time. God was still being faithful to the Jewish people, honoring God's covenants because of the efforts of Esther. Let's think back now to other parts of the Old Testament. This is not the first time we've seen this in the Bible of someone seemingly coming out of nowhere to act on behalf of God. Remember Moses, the prince of Egypt, who enjoyed the nice high life, who one day is drawn back to his Jewish roots, is expelled from Egypt, and then comes back to help his people escape slavery in Egypt. For such a time as this came to Esther, and you know what? I suspect that you, like myself, have had your own for such a time moments. That is, being called directly or indirectly by God to help people or one person and at a time when that help is really, really needed. We may have also had our moments in which we said, borrowing again from LBJ and Sherman, I will not act to help someone, God, even if you call me to do so. Been there, done that myself. But I've also had my own good times, such as these moments in my life, that while not coming close to what Esther did for her people, nevertheless, in looking back, helped people when they needed it because of my efforts. For example, I remember many nights of sitting in the rooms of Sinai Grace Hospital beds, rather, sitting in the rooms at Sinai Grace Hospital as a volunteer chaplain, and just sitting down with people and being a listener, a comforter, people who were facing uncertain times, fear that a pending surgery might lead to a troubling discovery of cancer, hearing that their life is on a very short time period, wondering if their recovery is taking a little bit longer than the doctor's said it would. I remember the times of being with couples who moments ago watched their premature child pass away and then helping to name their child before it was buried, honoring that life for such a short period of time that it was on earth. As I was told by a mentor of mine at the time, we are called to be the face of God and Jesus in those hospital rooms. Those were some of my most defining moments on the path to this place and becoming 
ordained and a pastor. Wonderful times in which I felt as though I was acting on behalf of our Creator. As I am reminded throughout our lives, there are times when we make huge decisions, decisions that will impact our lives and the people around us. Many decisions will be clear and easy to make. They're no-brainers, right? But others, whoa, others will be between what we want to do and what we know is the right thing to do. Consequences and risk, of course, come with every decision. May we always, may we always have the courage to do what is right. Esther had the courage to do what is right, to face down genocide for her people. As Christmas approaches, let us remember how Mary and Joseph and their baby Jesus faced the prospect of genocide, which led them to become refugees and flee Israel for Egypt to avoid seeing Jesus being killed by King Herod's edict that all firstborn males of Israel be killed. God, through Jesus Christ, came down from above to dwell among us, and in doing so, gave all of us the peace of God, the constant presence of God in our midst, now and forever, and all as we go about doing this tough job of being disciples of Christ. Advent and this time of waiting, waiting, is about, in this particular light, another kind of waiting. Waiting and watching for when we are called to act at God's behest. So, in all of our future for such a time as these moments when we are called to act and speak out for those in need around us, we remember, Emmanuel, God is with us. God is with us. No matter what decision we make, God will never leave us alone in it all. Shalom. Shalom. Peace. Peace. Peace be with us. Would you join me now in prayer? God, this morning we have lit the candles of hope and peace. We long for your coming again to be with us in the future. And in the meantime, we ask you to be with us and embolden us to call out to continue calling out anti-Semitism, to continue calling out hate speech and the targeting of people by their lot in life, their status for being different than us. Help us to work with others to stamp out hate speech and acts of violence against people, whether it be in this country or the United States or the world. Lord, we will soon light the candle of peace. We ask you to continue to help us work to bring peace in our country, among people in the world. We pray for peace in Ukraine. We pray for the missiles to stop being fired into Ukraine from Russia and the targeting of the power grid and having people kept in the dark without heat without power. Blessed be the peacemakers, God. Lord, we ask you to help us bring about an end to the daily horror of seeing yet more people being targeted in violence. Help us to open hearts and minds around us. We are ready to be called into action. Call us. Lord, we are a thankful people. We thank our men and women in the military serving and protecting us. We pray for all the people on our prayer list in our new newsletter that has come out. 
be with them and guide them and comfort them, God, and comfort us for we too are hurting in some way, shape, or form. And Lord, we also thank you for all the blessings you've given us, the many blessings that despite these challenging times, we say and look up to you and say thank you for we are grateful people for the blessings you have and continue to give us. And now, Lord, we pause and say to you our own prayers and petitions to you, silently or out loud. Lord, I pray for continued recovery for Dennis and for Glenn. Pray to watch over Dennis and Vladimir and my relatives in Ukraine. I pray for Noah. Lord, for such a time as this in prayer, we conclude with the prayer that was taught by the one who is to come and that we are waiting for to come again. We say together, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings Would you please pray with me our offertory prayer? God, receive these gifts by your grace. Multiply and use them to accomplish Christ's work of love in the world. Amen. And now, my friends, would you please be seated and let us sing together two verses of Let Us Break Bread Together to prepare for communion. Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together on our knees. And I call on my dew, new dice and rising sun. Amen to that, Glenn. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You who come to me will not hunger. 
You who believe in me shall never thirst. So, in the company with all who hunger for spiritual food, we come to the table this morning, or wherever our table is, to know the risen Christ and the sharing of life-giving bread and the cup. Please pray with me. God, our loving creator, you're close to us as breathing and distant as the farthest star. We thank you for all that sustains life, our life, but especially for Jesus Christ's birth, life, death, and resurrection, and for the calling forth of your church for its mission in the world. God, gifted by the present presence rather of your Holy Spirit, we offer ourselves to you as we unite with our voices with the entire family of your faithful everywhere. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking at the table today so that our eyes may be opened and we may recognize the risen Christ in our midst, in each other, and in all for whom Christ died. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus broke bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body that has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Think of me always when you break and partake in bread. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, and after supper, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and others for the forgiveness of sins. When you drink from this cup, think of me. Think of me. Through this broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. And through this cup of blessing, we are truly blessed and are asked to participate in a new life with Jesus Christ. My friends, the table of the Lord is ready. Come.
would you please pray with me now our, our, our prayer from our communion. We thank you, most holy God, for refreshment at your table. Give us the grace to praise you with our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. amen. And now would you please rise, if you are able, and let us sing our closing hymn. It is Angels from the Realm of Glory. Angels from the realm of glory Shepherds in the abiding, watching over your flocks by night. God with man is now residing. Yonder shines the faint in light. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Sages, leave your contemplations, brighter visions beam afar. Seek the great desire of nations, ye have seen his mortal star. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Saints before the altar bending, watching long in hope and fear. Suddenly the Lord descending in his temple shall appear. Come and worship, come and worship Christ the, new, the newborn King. Amen. For such a time as this, for such a time as this, always heed the call for such a time as this. Go, my friends, to love and serve our Lord. Amen.